Um, so uh, I'm Jenna Ellis. Um, I'm at Rapid7, um, and uh, I sort of focus on uh, how do we work as a community to find uh, collaborative solutions to security. Uh, and good morning. Uh, my name is Leonard Bailey. I'm Special Counsel for National Security at the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section at the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, first, I'd say thank to, thanks to Jen for inviting me to participate with her, and thanks for B-Sides for accepting this uh, this presentation. Um, Why are you always going to make me look bad? You start thanking people. I haven't thought, thanked anyone. <laughs> Fine. I'd like to thank Petri, who's our speaker liaison. <laughs> thanks, Petri. Excellent. So, so um, <laughs> Uh, a, a couple of things quickly about my office. Uh, I mean, one thing I wanted to make sure I announced was this morning, just a couple hours ago, we released, released a vulnerability disclosure framework. Um, we've been working with the security researcher community on issues that relate to the CFAA and concerns about that statute and doing research. Uh, we set out to create a document that would help companies that were looking to create a formal vulnerability disclosure program um, do so in a way that was clear and avoided some of the CFA authorization questions that sometimes arise. So if you go to DOJ Cybersecurity Unit, um, you will find various documents we posted there. Among them is this vulnerability disclosure framework. So there's that. Um, and with that, we're going to hop into our present. Yeah, I'm not going to pitch something that Rapid Seven's done recently because I'm a professional. <laughs> 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 oh, the irony. <laughs> My clicker's not working. Your clicker's not working? Is that something you've seen a doctor about? Um, okay, so just a quick disclaimer because uh, Selectula actually apparently is not affiliated with this talk in any way, so we'll let you read it. <laughs> um, okay, and, and, uh, and, and very quickly, just to kind of give you a bit of a lay of the land, um, how many people saw our, our talk on CFA last year at B-Sides? Oh, it's in a completely fresh room. That's amazing. I love that. That um, explains a lot. Right. I was like, should we be upset that nobody came back? No. Uh, <laughs> we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, so so, so <laughs> this, is, this is the obligatory roadmap slide that you have. Um, what, one of the things we're trying to do with this talk in general is to just make sure everyone, before we get to the fun part, which will be sort of a debate discussion about the merits of, of, of hack back and the discussion of active defense, um, was to do some level setting. So, uh, as Jen suggested, we actually have Sir Mixlot to help us a lot through this talk. Um, I, I don't know if it's if I can call him Mr. A lot or what, but he's going to be <laughs> helping us throughout sir, this. You call him Sir. Uh, th thank you. Show some um, damn respect. So, <laughs> just to make sure we have sort of an agreement on what we're talking about, we'll talk about what hackback is, what it means, um, discuss a bit about the laws that apply to it, discuss some scenarios in which it does and does not apply. Uh, and then we'll get to sort of the controversy around whether it's a reasonable cybersecurity measure to, to adopt and um, use. Uh, so before we get started, we should probably address the all-important question of what the hell we're talking about. Um, and there are uh, lots of different terms and uses, uh, language, and it's all very confusing. I'm not going to say what's on that slide because I will sound like a Muppet. Um, but, but there's a lot of different things that people talk about, and one is hackback, and then there's um, all of these different terms of art that are coming up, and they all mean something a little bit different. Um, and some of them are super militaristic, and some of them are very defense-oriented. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, we're defining... Um, oh, oh, sorry, I missed the slide. Um, so basically what they come in at is a huge range of activities that go from like things that you do that are really all about defense, that are in your network, all the way through to things that are going to go out onto the internet and cause all sorts of problems for other people. And we're going to talk a little bit about like what the legality is around the range of things. But the way that we are defining hackback for the purposes of this talk, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Sir Mixalot. Please keep moving. <laughs> all right, so the way that we're defining it is three things. Um, it's private sector action. It's action that is taken in response to uh, action taken against you, so an attack against you. And um, it is action that is taken outside of technological assets that you own, control, or lease. So let me jump in here just to add a few things. Um, so you know, on the spectrum, from the sort of relatively passive activities that may be 
monitoring your network, IDS, IPS type of activities, maybe insider threat monitoring. Um, you know, in talking to companies, we've heard them use a variety of different capabilities that, that go beyond that and start doing things like touching other people's networks um, for different reasons. So for example, people who want to be able to trace their data, they may implant something on their data in their network, but you know, in kind of logic bomb fashion, when it's taken outside of the network, when certain conditions are met, it will do something, um, something unexpected and something that the owner of that network did not necessarily desire. Um, or you know, taking a step beyond that, if what you're doing is trying to track data that has been taken from you, um, you may want to secure that data on this remote network. Uh, people have described this as sort of you know, er erasing your data or retrieving your data, which I think is kind of a, a misnomer in part because in most intrusions, you still have your data. The problem is that someone else has it as well. So it, it often comes down to something like encrypting data on some remote network that you are trying to secure and, and keep from, you know, and restrain from being transferred. And then you get to sort of the, the damaging conduct. And when I say damaging, the reason why some quotation marks is um, there is a specific definition of, of damaging that we'll get to in the law under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, but you know, there has been in the policy sphere some discussion about what is damage. For example, you know, post Mirai, there were discussions about a good worm, right? A worm that would go out and repair networks. Uh, now, even though it is doing so arguably in the interest of good, uh, that type of altering the settings without the permission of the system owner or device owner would be considered damage under the CFAA. So there are lots of reasons that people say for why Hackback should be authorized, and we'll get into this a little bit more when we um, do our uh, uh, panel later. Um, the first is like the very fundamental thing of I want to be able to stop, stop an attack that's happening right now. It's a pretty straightforward, self-explanatory uh, statement, and um, I'm sure in the debate we'll talk about whether it's valid. <laughs> um, the the next one is um, all. Of, I mean, it's sort of taking that but making it more preemptive, right? So uh, it's all about trying to increase the cost of attack. Um, and trying to make it so that uh, that it, you're a less attractive target to attackers. So one that we all hear a lot is self-defense or self-help. Um, now this kind of borrows from the normal world of criminal law in the physical world, uh, where you have, for example, an assault. Someone says, I get to defend myself against an assault. Um, and even if you're outside the world of a physical assault, there's a question of sort of property-based help. So where you have a repo man, um, a repo man may go and retrieve data that, I mean data, um, property that someone has no longer been paying for. Uh, and that retrieval of that property can be considered self-help under some statutes. Um, there are various legal frameworks that permit that, regulatory schemes, uh, but that you know, can be considered self-help that people analogize to what happens when you go out and retrieve your data from a network. Uh, this is my favorite one, obviously, because um, I recently had the unpleasant experience of um, being hacked, which is super. I love it. Um, my name's Jed, and I've been hacked. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I can tell you that now I have a lot more sympathy with this particular uh, argument, because I was angry, um, and I wanted to be able to do something about it and take back control and feel empowered again. Um, and, and so I think it's... It's an understandable emotional reaction. Augmenting law enforcement. Now, I think the FBI reported last year that there's something like 4,000 ransomware attacks a day. So obviously, law enforcement is not going to be able to keep up with that pace. It's not going to, be able to investigate every instant. The argument is that why not have civilian capabilities augment what law enforcement you know, cannot get to, uh, perhaps by helping with attribution or other things that would even advance law enforcement's interests itself. So, so what are the laws that apply to hackback? And this is going to be, unfortunately, the lawyer part of the, the session, <laughs> so forgive me. Um, now, generally, this Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is the federal Ooh. hacking statute, um, is typically the one that, you know, the statute that people turn to immediately uh, think about. Now, for, for purposes of our talk, um, even though the Computer Fraud and Abuse actually is nine different offenses in one, we're going to really focus on, on three particular um, crimes under the statute. The first being um, intentionally authorizing um, or accessing a computer 
without authorization or in excess of authorization. This is a violation of 18 U.S.C. 1038-2. Um, so this, the gravamen of this offense really is the, the accessing of another computer without authorization. There's also an offense that involves knowingly causing the transmission of program code information that causes damage. So uh, this is in some ways an inchoate crime. This occurs before even the damage has occurred. If you have just transmitted it, um, so you know, if there, for example, were a worm that were unleashed, even before it caused damage, um, we might be able to move under this particular statute. And then lastly, the classic causing damage to a computer. It has to be damaged, though, uh, without authorization. So every day you go to work, you're on your computer, you erase words in a document. That technically under the law would be damaging a computer, but you're doing it with authorization. You are doing it as an employee of a, of a company or something of that sort. So that's, that's, not, that's not actionable. Um, this is damage without authorization. Now, if you look at these three different offenses, though, there is one common thread, and they all really turn on this issue of authorization. And that becomes an important element of this discussion about hackback, and we'll explain why in a moment. Oh, thank you, Sir Mix a lot. Um, <laughs> I almost forgot to mention. Um, so we talked about self-help a moment ago, and this is something that people often you know, ask, wait, is, is there some, some exception under the law that allows me to, to do something to help myself? Well, as the CFAA is drafted, no. There is no exception that specifically allows someone to engage in self-help. Um, there is a provision that carves uh, the government out from the statute in violation of the statute for uh, military law enforcement or intelligence functions done for protective intelligence or law enforcement purpose. Um, now, many of you may be thinking, you guys have gotten hacking stuff all day then, right? <laughs> um, the truth is, it's of marginal utility because the Fourth Amendment still applies. So most, most of the time, any of those activities is going to trigger a need for us to get a warrant or to satisfy the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. Um, and so the fact that there is an exception to the statute can be helpful, but by and large, it, it's not something that we can use as an authorization to just go and act without other authority. Uh, now, under the law, the, the scope of the CFA is, is quite broad. Um, it, it includes a computer that is located outside of the United States, and so it has some extraterritorial jurisdiction. What might that mean, Jen? Mm, it might mean that if you are on the East Coast and you get hacked, and you strike back about against someone using a really old computer on the West Coast, and it turns out that that's actually been used in attack by someone from Liechtenstein, which everybody knows is a crazy hotbed of cybercrime. <laughs> and also, by the way, one of only two double landlocked countries in the world. You can, you can Google what that means. Um, <laughs> just as an aside, you know. Uh, then you would be breaking the law not only in the US for, well, you would be breaking the law in the US, but not only because you're targeting the incredibly old machine on the West Coast, but also because you end up going to Liechtenstein. So it doesn't really even matter what the laws of Liechtenstein say uh, in the US, that is all illegal. So there you go. So I was meant to say something then about like, so this is all we need to worry about is the CFAA, and so Nick's a lot got ahead of me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the CFAA tends to be the, the statute that people kind of are concerned most about. Uh, one of the things that I like to make sure that people are aware of is you know, people talk about the cyber kill chain, right? And one of the first stages of the cyber kill chain is reconnaissance. What people lose in that discussion is that reconnaissance itself is activity that may be governed under federal law, and that would be under the electronic surveillance statute. So it's not just the CFA that may be of concern. Um, there are just a couple of statutes that also may be of concern, starting with the Wiretap Act. Uh, that may surprise you, but the Wiretap Act is a general prohibition applies to everyone, government and you know, civilians, uh, that prohibits the interception of electronic wire or, or oral communications. Um, now, the focus of the statute is the content of communications. Um, basically, I think it's defined as the substance, purport, or meaning of a communication. If you are intercepting that, you are potentially violating the Wiretap Act. Now, you may ask, well, doesn't it happen every day? Email providers intercept communications. Well, there are exceptions in the statute that apply to such services. 
um, that cover those types of, of applications. Um, there would not be for, for example, someone who was loading a sniffer into you know, some sort of, of, of file and had that taken and then you know, that resulted in the return of, of communications like a password. Now, separate from that, which is about the content of communications, there's something called the Pen Register and Trap and Trace Statute. Now, it's much like, in many ways, the Wiretap Statute, except the focus of this statute is not the content of communications. Rather, it's a prohibition on essentially using or installing a device that captures, records, or decodes dialing, routing, addressing, or signaling information. What does that essentially mean? Um, the shorthand is if you are uh, using some sort of technique that is capturing non-content information, you may be dealing with a pen register trap and trace issue. Uh, and for example, when we do something like we, let's say, go up on uh, an email account and attempt to grab an IP address for people logging in, we would go and get a pen trap order that would allow us to do that. Um, now, one other thing that goes with the pen register trap and trace statute and the wiretap statute is both of them have exceptions that are, for example, consent. So consent becomes an important way of complying with these statutes. Uh, and so there's a way out. There is not merely getting an order, there is making sure that you comply with the law through you know, making sure your programs and your activity is structured in a certain way. So yeah, so, uh, so Leonard just talked through the federal laws, um, since he works for the federal government. Uh, but there are also 50 um, state level uh, cybercrime laws that would also make hackback illegal. And then obviously there's international law. There is, to, to the best of my knowledge, there's no country where this is officially legal. There may be countries where we believe that it's sanctioned, um, but there are no countries, to the best of my knowledge, where it's officially legal. Um, and there are some countries that might be thinking about authorizing it on an official level at the moment. Um, and so like this debate around what the implications could be and the impact internationally is incredibly relevant right now because you know these countries are thinking about doing this stuff right now and it, it will have a huge impact on, on the internet as a whole and on the US. So how do these laws apply to actual hackback scenarios? <laughs> All right, so uh, this is your network. Probably your network has more than three computers, but this is your network for the purpose of this. Um, and you have defenses uh, set up around your network. You have the usual range of defenses, um, firewalls and all that good stuff. And all of that's fine, that's fine. And then you have some other things that you do that are part of active defense. So uh, some of it might be about uh, detection or about filtering traffic. Some of it might be about, uh, you can move on. Um, you can, you, oh, ooh, God, move on. Um, and you can do things like you can have honeypots and you can have decoys and all of that's fine as long as it's in your network. Now, one of the things we discussed that makes it okay in your network is within your network, you have the capability of getting authorization or consent, right? So in your workplace, that's why you have your logon banners, that's why you have your workplace policies, that's why you have all the things that allow the employer who owns the network to be able to say, hey, I got authorization of the consent of this user to do this monitoring activity or to intercept these sort of communications. Now, that's inside your network. And that's a good dividing line in talking about hackback uh, and any other cyber defense activities. Once you get outside the network, it's a little different, right? You, you don't have the same means of getting authorization or consent from these other parties who you're not in commercial privity with, um, who you, you know, never have contact with. And in fact, in some cases, they're the person who broke into your network. So you're not gonna be asking them for consent or authorization to monitor what they're doing. Um, so there you've got the issue. There's a like, pretty clean dividing line between inside the network and outside just based on your legal ability to obtain the sort of consent and other you know, permissions that make this okay under the law. So that makes it kind of hard to square with the law as it exists now. So let's talk about some specific scenarios, tracing or securing data. Now one of the things that we hear, one of the first ones that uh, you know, I remember hearing about in this area was, hey, what about the electronic die pack? Uh, we can do that or plant some sort of web bug or something that allows us to trace back our data to a network and then take some other action. Um, now, 
what may be implicated there, and this goes back to our discussion of electronic surveillance statutes, is um, if, for example, what you're doing is you're sending a packet back to your network so that you could retrieve an IP address that identifies the uh, server that opened that. Well, there's at least a question about whether the pen trap statute applies in that scenario. If we were doing that for a law enforcement purpose, we would have to deal with that in some sense, possibly getting a pen trap order from the court. Um, similarly, let's say once you've located your data, you go out and you encrypt it. Now, you may think that's a reasonable thing to do. It's, it's, let's say you were right and it is your data and you're encrypting it, but there are two issues, at least. One is, do you have to access another network in order to effectuate that encryption? Which means that you may be dealing with unauthorized access to a protected computer. Um, in addition, and this is kind of more academic, but it's at least an issue, uh, in rendering at least part of someone's own network unavailable to that owner, are you doing damage to that network? Uh, novel issue, no court has talked about it, but there is at least some argument that that may fall into the strict definition of what damage is under the CFAA. I think this is you, my friend. <laughs> okay. Um, so when it comes to uh, imposing costs, um, it's the same thing, right? Like it's exactly the same thing. You can't you can't affect damage on uh, anything outside of your control. Um, if you want to tear down the world that's inside your network, that's fine. But when it comes to going outside it, planting anything like malware or anything like that that is going to make uh, the idea of attacking you considerably less palatable is going to be incredibly against the law. And that includes uh, decoy ducks. Because you, it's fine if you're doing something in your network. And I like to call this slide uh, ducks given. Um, anyway, uh, it's fine if it's inside your network for you to use deceptive technologies. And we use deceptive technologies, which I probably shouldn't have said, but we do. And, and that's totally fine. What you can't do is have something that like is going to create um, uh, a sort of monitoring action. So if you have something that will go out of your network and will then report back in some way, that's where you get into trouble. Because um, as Leonard discussed, that's surveillance, basically. And so that's going to fall foul, foul of the surveillance statutes. But if all you're doing is putting out false information, that's all you're doing. You put out, and for whatever reason you're trying to, again, impose costs by having your adversary waste time you know, processing information that you don't intend to use. That's not going to be a violation of the CFAA. Um, you have not accessed your network to do that. They have taken it, retrieved it, brought it to their own network. You don't have to effectuate any sort of, you know, send any command in order to get that done. Um, so, you know, that's an example of something that might happen that may have consequences outside your network that would not be, for example, a violation of the federal statutes. Now, in December of 2015, we had a new law, CISA. Um, now, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act it essentially did three things. One, it provided new affirmative authority to monitor information or an information system, notwithstanding any other provision of law. Now, why is that important? Well, notwithstanding any other provision of law is sort of the tactical nuclear strike of legal language. It means it overrides any other law, including the Wiretap Act. So, if you are monitoring your network, for what is defined as a cybersecurity purpose, you may do so without fear of violating any laws. The second thing that CISA did was um, it had authority, notwithstanding any other provision of law again, to apply what are called defensive measures to information or an information system, again, for a cybersecurity purpose. Um, we're going to come back to that in a second. The, last, the third thing was information sharing authority. Uh, it authorized you to share cyber threat information and defensive measures again, for a cybersecurity purpose. That's less you know, relevant to our discussion today, very relevant to computer security research, which uh, we should do a presentation on <laughs> some other time. But um, on the defensive measures provision, uh, here's what's important about that. So when Congress created this defensive measures of authorization, there was concern, including from the Department of Justice, that what it would do was create a backdoor hole in the CFAA that said, it's not a violation of the CFA to do something 
for a cybersecurity purpose that included breaking into a network or damaging a network. Um, and we thought that that was not, without further banding, a good idea. Congress seemed to agree, um, and in fact, it intentionally drafted the provision to carve out hackback activity. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that because in the only thing we have that sort of legislative history of that act, the joint explanatory statement that was issued by the House and the Senate on this bill, they specifically said, significantly the authorization for defensive measures does not include activities that are generally considered offensive in nature, such as an authorized access of, or excuse me, and again, specifically, it carves out hackback activity. So whatever they intended under this new authorization, it did not include hackback. Now, the way this was effectuated was in defining what a defensive measure was, they carved out activity that destroys, renders unusable, or substantially harms information or an information system, and they carved out anything that provided unauthorized access to information or an information system. I ask myself this question every day. Yeah. So as I mentioned, there's monitoring authority. So if, for example, you have some honeypot out in the world and you have it kind of disguised so it's not, you don't want it to look like part of your system. Well, as long as you actually are the operator of it, CISA authorizes you to, again, monitor it you know, as much as you want, as long as it's for a cybersecurity purpose. Now, you may ask, well, well then can I monitor like, <laughs> the network of the guys breaking into me, uh, my, my network? And the answer to that is no for this reason. Along with that, Congress said, yes, you may monitor a third party's network, but only with the authorization and written consent of that third party. So that's not going to help you with an adversary, right? Uh, but it would help you with your own honeypot. So yes, as long as you have a cybersecurity purpose, you can do a lot. And I would put that another way, or I think he would, and say, he likes big pots and he cannot lie. Oh. Uh. I'll be here all week. <laughs> Try the steak. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, how about some high bag legislation getting well, serious a little bit? Um, so there has been a proposal in the US this year. Um, it's been introduced twice uh, by Tom Graves, and it is called the Active Cyber Defense Certainty Act, ACDC. Um, and it looks to uh, create an exemption under the CFPB. Uh, you have to turn the volume up because it's a really good way of turning it down earlier so people are not going to get the full effect. Am I going to have to go back? Yeah, you might have to. Um, so there it is. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, so um, it <laughs> oh my god, it's so not worth this. <laughs> um, okay, so. What it does is it looks to create an exemption under the CFAA uh, for, as the slide says, attributional, attributional activities. Oh my god, that was hard to say. Um, and, and so like it really, it focuses on the piece around trying to figure out who is doing the attack and what they're after and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really about like sending information back and that kind of thing. What it doesn't do... Uh, is it doesn't, sorry, I can't see the slides changing very well. Um, so what it doesn't do is anything beyond that. So I would um, urge you to go and read it. It's two and a half pages. It will take you three minutes to read. Um, and for something as complex, whoa, uh, something as complex as Hackback, that is uh, a little crazy in my opinion because uh, what it doesn't do at all is address any of the like very serious challenges that exist, which we're gonna discuss at length in the next portion of the talk. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't answer them. It doesn't give any proposal for how you would make hackback work in reality in a pragmatic way. Um, all it really does is do this sort of carve out to the CFA. It doesn't, it doesn't even address the, um, the surveillance statutes issue. It just sort of has this carve out to the CFA around the idea of attribution. And let me say formally, the Department of Justice doesn't have a position on the ACDC. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <Rapid 7 does. laughs> but I mean, we, we've, we've had some contact with uh, folks on the Hill who have drafted it. And you know, one, we, we do applaud them for trying because with all the discussion of, of, of hackback and you know, creating authority, um, no one has 
really try to get that in writing. Um, I think one thing we've seen, and I think that they appreciate it, is exactly how hard it is and how hard it is to get right. There are so many different interests and, and issues that, that attach to it. <laughs> so. I like big policy debates. And I cannot lie. You other brothers can't deny. And when a girl walks in with an itty bitty waist and a round thing in your uh, face, you get sprung. I like <laughs> big policy debates. <laughs> and I cannot lie. You other brothers can't Oh my god. Yeah, we should just have the rest of the talk be that over and over again. Um, so before we get into this, uh, I want to say, all joking aside, you should go and look at the Department of Justice's uh, vulnerability disclosure. Uh, what is the word you're using for it? Framework. Framework. Um, I would urge you to go and look at that on, on the interwebs. Um, and so... Uh, sure, well, I, if you, actually, if you just um, did a web search, it doesn't, it's not showing up? Really? Uh, yes, if you, it's on the first page, of, if, you, if you go to the DOJ CCIPS, CCIPS, which is the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property section, CCIPS, um, DOJ um, web page, um, there is a heading for white papers, and under white papers there's a heading for vulnerable disclosure, and you should find it there. And bravo to the people who've already gone and looked, well done. Um, all right, so without further ado, we're going to invite our um, panelists up, and one of them's going to bring a chair over, hopefully, otherwise we are a little stuck. Um, and can we also ask for the, 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 the thing you can turn off? Sorry. I have no words. Projector. That's the word I was looking for. I don't know that the pony has that much to say, honestly. He seems like the strong silent type to me. Uh, so just for anyone who's wondering, um, Len and I very reasonably asked for uh, pink ponies uh, that we could ride in on for our talk. Um, this was if they didn't book some mix a lot to sing us in, which I felt was a completely reasonable ask. Um, and so there's a pink pony for Leonard back there because he, he was not willing to bend on the color and I have a purple one. Um, you can look after him. He's, Good, Mine is napping. <laughs> I think Leonard shot him earlier, which is a little awkward. Um, all right, so. It seems like the thing. writing part is missing. Uh, <laughs> I wrote in on mine. Just because you didn't see it is, doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, all right, so I'm going to ask you guys to introduce yourselves, please. Um, Darby, do you want to start us off? Okay. On? Is it on? Hello? Hello. Oh, Davi Ottenheimer, that's my name, and uh, I work for MongoDB now. I'm probably better known for Flying Penguin, which is a company I ran for years. And I guess I should mention in 2012, I did um, a lot of active defense work and started a company uh, to actually get a court case heard on this topic. And I can say that we were a failure because no one actually heard the case. We never got one into public eye. But that was the focus of my work for a number of years. And then also, I fo focused on cloud and big data security for a long time, back to 90, 1999. So when they talk about these perimeters, I instantly think that's just bullshit. <laughs> Should we have like a bullshit card? Yeah, I thought you were going to bring one. Uh, we'll, we'll go busy. Nathaniel Gleischer, I'm head of cybersecurity strategy at Illumio, which is a data center and cloud security company. Before that, I was at the National Security Council at the White House, and before that, I worked with Leonard at DOJ. So uh, computer science and uh, legal background, which means I never know whether to put on a hoodie or wear a suit, and I kind of end up strangely in between. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rob Graham. Um, I've created a number of stuff. Um, back in 1998, I created Black Ice. It was the first IPS. It was also a desktop firewall. It had a number of actual hackback features in it. It would go back and scan you, or it would um, manipulate traffic in, in, in fun ways to, to frustrate the attacker. And, it, and uh, over the years, that Black Ice was bought by ISS and then by IBM. And IBM sort of just canceled the, the product. But if you scan the internet, you'll see occasionally uh, net bias node status queries from, on high, from, coming from high ports, three of them in a row. And that's actually black guys coming back and scanning you and saying, why are you scanning me? So it's still out there and active in various places in the world for whatever reason. And I do a bunch of other stuff like mass scan and, and uh, side jacking and other stuff. And you already know us, so we're not going to reintroduce ourselves. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna start off by asking since I know you guys never agree with me on anything. Um, 
how you feel about the definition of hack factor that we're using. Do you feel like before we get into talking about why it should or should not happen, are you happy with the definition? Yeah, it's a perfect definition. I think the most important part is that it, it says when you are touching computers that you don't own, lease, or for whatever reason, they're not your systems. And I think that's the critical part versus other active defensive techniques when you're touching your own systems. I guess I would disagree because, I mean, my background before computers was in the intervention ethics arena. Uh, I studied history for a long time, and so the sort of gray area always exists in concepts of ownership. And since I worked in cloud for so long and virtualization and shared environments, it's not clear to me when authorization really has been granted officially versus you're on somebody else's machine that they've allowed you to be on. Um, parents are a good example of this. They haven't authorized you per se, but you just know you're a child of theirs so you can get on and do stuff. Cloud is that to the nines. So. One thing that I would add, um, it's, a de it's a good definition, but it does cover a wide range of specific elements, and I think for hackback discussions in particular, the devil is really in the details. So you have beaconing in that definition, and then you have targeted destruction of property in that definition, and those both fall under it, and it makes sense to talk about both of them, but the trade-offs and the consequences with them are very different. Okay, great. So why don't we get into some of that specifics. Um, how about, uh, W, you give us some of your case for um, why hackback should be authorized and it should be okay, and what kinds of hackback you need? Well, there are lots of good, I think there's sort of an ethical angle to this, which is, and you mentioned a lot of it, but is, you know, should you help somebody who's drowning or should you stand there and laugh at them and take a video? Um, I think there are a lot of cases where you know you can help and you go in without authorization being explicit, but you have access. Uh, so in that case, they would thank you for coming in and saving them from worse harm by going after somebody who was hurting them that they didn't even see or they weren't home. Like taking over a house when somebody is invading it and those people are on vacation, for example. There are a lot of cases where uh, I've been asked, for example, to go in and, and find out who's stealing things and then stop them from stealing it. So and in that sense, I've been asked to get onto systems that are being used for thefts that are in shared environments that they don't own, but I don't own. And so I feel like there are a lot of cases where the ethics would be on the side of the person trying to do right. So l let me raise one issue that I, I think comes up a lot in this debate. I think most people, when they're thinking about what should be permissible as a hackback activity, they put themselves in the, in the shoes of the good guy. I'm going out to do something and, and, and to repair something, as opposed to, let's say, that third party um, network owner. So now you are the owner of that network who gets a call from someone who says, you know, I just went in and changed your settings because, well, they're going to be better this way. Um, uh, or the person who says, you know, I had some information on your network that was taken from me and dropped there. I, I found it, I erased it, um, I had to look around and make sure I got the right stuff. Um, but we're all good now, don't worry about it. I think from that vantage point, it starts kind of teasing out why some of this on a policy level is, is problematic. Because, you know, are we in a better situation where that is happening, you know, liberally, um, or, or not? I mean, I, th I think there's, there's a, you could, you could debate that either, either way. I tend to think we're not, though. Yeah, in a shared data center, for example, you can go in and you can find a lock that's been broken by someone else and fix the lock. And you're not authorized to fix it in the data center. I, this actually happened to me. They try to get angry and try to arrest me. But I'm like, look, it's better than it was before. And this is a shared environment. So I'm just doing it for my own purposes as well as for other people. So, so what you were saying, Leonard, is, is that there's a gray area that, mal, uh, that bad people can use to say, hey, I'm... I'm, I'm hacking back for good, but they're actually doing something for evil. Is that what you're saying? Uh, actually, no. I, I, I mean, that could be the case, but I'm actually more thinking of, let's say you are entrusted with information or you are trying to secure your own network, and someone has now altered it in a way that they claim is for, for good or, right. or for their own interest, but not against yours. For, for example, I, someone had, I, let's say I have an NTP server that's being used for reflection. That's right. 600 times... They send me a request, I reflect it back 600 times more for being used for DDoS. Okay. So someone comes in, hacks my computer, and turns it off, or reconfigures it to no longer do reflection. I'm not happy because it's no longer performing as I want, but obviously I've been harming people more than, than whatever. So they, were, they had a good intent. I'm not happy with it potentially. Maybe I am happy with it. But either way, um, they had good intent, and it stopped that, that DDoS attack. Okay. 
Well, what about, let me give you another example, which riffs off what Leonard was talking about, which is you, um, someone's using you to store stolen data. They've transited through your system, they're storing stolen data on that system. And the person whose data was stolen comes into your system, finds it, and deletes it. And then they tell you. And they say, I had to look around a little bit, like Leonard was saying. And it turns out you have a bunch of sensitive data on that system that you really care about, totally unrelated from the fact that it would, had been compromised and was being used. How do you feel or how concerned are you about the fact that this other person was in your system mucking around? Sort of say, oh, I don't need that, I don't need that. This is mine, I'm going to get rid of it. And maybe they did exactly what they said, and they didn't look at anything else. Maybe they only removed their own data, but now from your perspective, there were two people in your system doing stuff and you don't know what they were doing and now you have to try to figure it yeah, out. Yeah, you know, if that was a lawyer's computer uh, and someone said, I accessed your computer um, and they've got files from other legal cases, now they've got a, a duty to go to the court and say, hey, someone may have read all the files of my computer right. whether or not they did or not and that would be a, a terrible thing. But on the other hand, this brings up the question of, of culpability of the, that third-party system, whether it's a DDoS reflector or some of the stashing of stolen files, is they're helping commit crime. This actually happened last year. In other words, last year, there's a metric we have on IoT devices that were stolen by Yeah, that's why they, they mentioned the good worm for the uh, Mirai worm. Uh, people made a, a, a worm that would be the good worm that went and patched a lot of the Mirai systems that were part of DDoS. Yeah, this just happened with Ethereum too, right? They went and they tried to stop the, the coins from being stolen by hacking in and changing the, the code. It just sounds like antivirus to me, honestly, when you describe this. It's, uh, have you authorized it to the extent it's operating? Maybe, but it's going and changing things for your own good. This is next gen antivirus for you? Well, pretty much. In, in the Ethereum hack, it, when you look at the details, what they did, the, the good guys, the bad guys had stolen like $30 million worth of tokens. The good guys noticed this and went and stole the rest of the $208 million worth of tokens that were used in that same code. Without authorization. Without, <laughs> well, yeah, but did they access the computer, by the way? It's a question. But anyway, um, and then, so they stole the money. They stole all the tokens. They're then, they belong to the hackers. And then the hackers went and returned the, the, all that, those tokens back to the original owners, but with a new contract um, that didn't have that bug. So they stole $208 million worth of money. They confiscated. Confiscated, well. Quarantined. <laughs> I, and I think one of the one of the one of the challenges in having this discussion is is pinning down exactly the, the specific scenario you're talking about. So, you know, absolutely, there are definitely these examples that are are you know I'd argue fringe cases that are important, and you have to figure out how to figure it uh, fit into a policy framework. Um, there are some others that are kind of in that realm that raise other questions. Let me pivot to one issue, which is I mean, one of the reasons why the department has been critical of hackback is not just that it's illegal. We're just not sure it's good policy, um, and it, it it might be bad policy for um, of of a variety of reasons. But when we talk to people about things like, hey, I think I want to be able to go and retrieve my data, we keep coming back to the question of is this effective. Right. If, if, if these are effective means of dealing with a problem, we really have to look at it and figure out whether these are changes that should be made in the law so that they can be done you know, more, more liberally, more broadly. Uh, with something like retrieving your data, for example, I mean, the problem we've run into in talking to people and trying to trace how that would work is one, people are saying, well, if I see it leaving my network, well, let's stop there, um, we, we know that yeah, different numbers, but anywhere between 60 and 200 days is how long it takes, is about dwell time for, for intruders. So it's possible you're watching in real time someone take your data, but it's more likely you're discovering it long after the fact when it's already traveled and it's already somewhere where it's traveled again and again and again. Then, let's say you, though, did see that. You were there, you saw it travel. Well, to do something, you'd have to be able to access the remote network. How is it you have access to the remote network? Either you don't, or you're now breaking into the remote network. Again, taking us to the question of, are we in a better place if basically to retrieve your data, you're breaking into other networks to, to get it? Um, and then you come to the question that we just talked about, which is whether you would be rooting around in someone's network 
which in our mind, we think of the CFA as kind of a privacy statute um, as well as kind of a property statute. And if you are going to be kind of running through other people's networks, you are compromising potentially the information that's there. So one of the issues I run into is this is really gray area and that's where I like to live and there's no hard edge the way it's described. Like somebody hasn't authorized you can change quickly if you send them something which they click on which authorizes you and then they've said yes without realizing. So have you deceived them or have you presented it in a way that they're just willing to go along with? And I feel like in order to write policy we have to have a robust debate but part of the problem is and why we tried to start this company was there's a lot of this going on. It's happening. And we can't talk about it because every time I get on uh, the subject and say it's pretty good and it works, people say, do you like being arrested on stage? Because that's what happens if you talk about how good it is and what you're doing. So I think we're hearing from people who are opposed much more often than those doing it who see no advantage to really bringing it up and talking about it. So you're saying that you're like a brave pioneer. I'm not doing it, so it makes <laughs> it easy for me to talk about it. But others are. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You're taking notes, right, Lennon? Yeah. Um, so just a quick note on, on questions. We, we're going to like let the conversation run, and then if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll stop and take questions, OK? Just wanted to let people know. So uh, on Leonard's point about uh, how they, they, they view the policy question, it, it depends upon what, what samples you're using to, to look at this. Because uh, one, one way to look at the hackback is, OK, I have a packet denied by the firewall. So I'm going to then launch a huge DDoS against it to determine to uh, against the source in order to deter the hacker. Then we all know that's a hugely stupid idea because that's a spoof packet in all likelihood, and you're now DDoSing innocent victims. So I've chosen there a, an example of hackback that's a very bad policy versus like the policy with Ethereum or the the good uh, Mirai worm. Um, of, of things that people do that obviously have benefits. There's so much we can do to stop botnets, to stop ransomware, to stop viruses, to stop DDoS, if we had the gloves taken off and we're allowed to actually address that and go after the perpetrators of these things. And it, we do occasionally, but it's illegal. Yeah, to that point, I find also with mules, we tend to arrest, if you know what mules are, people that are doing things on behalf of someone else. It's stupid in the sense that you're going after the person who's attacking you, and that's not really the source, but that's kind of like arresting all the mules and not getting to the mob boss. And so we do that to a large extent, and it seems okay, but we sort of frown on people going after the mules on a, in the logical world. So I think it's important to disaggregate. So you guys had earlier a slide about goals, and thinking about what we're doing and why we're doing it is really important, because we're talking about two different types of hackback here, right? One is I'm a company. I, or an individual, I've been targeted, someone did something bad to me, and I'm trying to either make them stop. Right? So it's a one-to-one -one ratio in some sense. Right? It's a retail response. And the second, if we're talking about the Ethereum and sort of the Mirai response, this is much more, there's a big industry-wide problem or community-wide problem, and I'm trying to provide a service to help solve it. It's much more about making everyone safer as opposed to making that guy stop doing that. And they're very different interactions. And the cost and consequences of the two of them are very different. And if you think, for each of them, what we're really asking is, there is a sum total of, say, $100 of security investment that an individual organization can make or a community can make as a whole. And for every dollar that gets invested in offensive responses in hackback, that is a dollar that does not get invested in other types of responses. And so the question that we would be asking in these two very different frames is, is moving, or is moving those dollars a good idea? Is it better to spend $80 on defense and $20 on hackback, or 50 and 50, or not? And in each of those environments, the answer is very different, is what I would argue. And I think by conflating them, we sort of end up in exactly the problem that you're mentioning, which is we have different examples, and it's easy to pick an example and then talk a little bit past the trade-offs and consequences. So, so let's do it. Let's, let's break them apart. Like, let's look at uh, Rob's example of um, things like Mirai and start there, and then we'll, we'll, we'll address the other one. So what are, the, what are the arguments against taking action in those kinds of situations? Well, in the, in the good worm, in the case of Mirai, it damaged a lot of the cameras, so the cameras no longer functioned. So they, they, they no longer did their, their primary purpose, but they stopped doing the evil thing of spreading the worm and doing DDoS. Seems like a, a pretty strong argument against doing a thing. Well, no. <laughs> Potentially. I, I, like for example, we are, most of us are Americans. We're in America right now. And most, <laughs> and, but most of the Mirai botnet was outside of America. It was in Vietnam, it was yes. Ukraine, it was all over the place, not in the United States. 
So you think about going with this. So we it doesn't similar. really matter because they're not American. But what I'm saying is <laughs> domestic policy is different than foreign policy. Sure. Domestic policy might say, hey, no, we're not going to damage the cameras. Foreign policy is a yes, definitely we're going to damage those cameras. And, and cause countries like Vietnam to like, take control of their networks and stop flooding us with traffic. So a foreign policy might have a very different answer to this question. But we all have to live on so, the internet together, Rob. Well, but the, and, and that's a choice that one would expect a government to make. Right? In the, the, the hackback, we, we're narrowed to private actors here, which is an interesting constraint. So we're imagining individuals or companies making a decision that directly impacts a foreign policy choice. Or people that left the government work in private companies. Hypothetically. <laughs> <laughs> Dancing around the word intent, and by the way, intent is a legal definition. So what you're really, I mean, you're dancing around the word. So I actually don't think. I think the problem here isn't so much intent. I think the problem is consequences and result. Because you can you can engage in off network hacking with very good intent and have very bad consequences. And you can engage in off network hacking with very bad intent and have very bad consequences. It depends on the the the, the result. And to your point, Jen. I think one of the challenges in the Mirai context is, or any of these, when you're trying to solve a community-wide problem, it's an incredibly complex problem, and you're going to be touching many, 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 many systems, which means there are many, many, many variables, and it's hard to get predictive or reliable results, which is what happened in this context. Yeah, and I, I, will, I will just, uh, on the intent point, I, I don't think, personally, I don't think we're dancing around it. We, we had a slide on it. Um, I, think, uh, I think the issue is that we're taking as read that intent is good in the discussion, but that doesn't change the fact that outcome can be bad. Well, I can, I'm sorry, I, I actually can address that, just, just to be clear. I mean, and this may be a criticism of law, but the violation under, for example, the CFA, accessing a computer without access is that you knowingly access the system. It's not that you knowingly access to break it, it's that you knowingly access it. And so that violation is completed if you knowingly do that. Um, under the damage provision, if you intentionally access that and cause damage, that's the standard. And so actually the, the law does take that into account. It, it may not accommodate this circumstance where people would say, hey, we're doing it for entirely great, awesome reasons. Um, but it does, under the law, have a requirement that you take action with a certain intent built in. In other words, you intentionally access the system without authorization. Right. That's what the law says. It says nothing about whether it's for good or bad purposes, right. whether your intent is to be a good person or a bad person. Right. So if you know you're not authorized, but if you think you are authorized, then... <laughs> well, so, by the way, one of the funny things about the CFA is that that doesn't, doesn't work either. Because then they'll come back and question you, like, well, would a reasonable person have thought that they were authorized? And if you think you're <laughs> authorized, but a reasonable person in general would not think that, then you're guilty of intending to have unauthorized access. <laughs> Which is a problem for us, because we, we are not the average person, and we have a definition of intent. Like We think, well, authorization is you know ROC 26 something or other for the HTTP that has the authorization code. And because it said authorize, I'm authorized. And uh, the average person <laughs> would not have that. So I think one of the problems you're, facing, you're, you're surfacing here, which I think is absolutely right, is that you know, by and large, statutes are written in the main to deal with people in the main. When you're dealing with actually what researchers do and the sort of good uses of, of the, you're talking about fringe cases by and large. And if you look at the cases that are brought in the CFA, it's what you would expect. It's Carter's, it's people who, you know, sysadmin who was mad and broke the system. It's, it's stuff that actually is without question, you know, what we, what we consider illegal conduct. In these instances, it's harder because you know there are there are mitigating circumstances. The law is not always well crafted to address those, and one could say, well, well, why don't you draft it that way? Unfortunately, it's akin to saying, why don't you draft perfect code? And the response, in part, is, well, because someone may take it and repurpose it and use it in a way that I didn't intend. Bingo. Um, that someone may take the law that was drafted to deal with the Carter and then use it in a way that you know was not intended to maybe apply in that circumstance, it still applies though. So anyway, just one, one booster for the CFA, because I'm the only <laughs> one in the room who will speak up for it. <laughs> well, I'll give you an example where it's so old, you know it didn't happen recently, but let's say that you're on a contractor network, which isn't yours, but it is someone you have a relationship with and are authorized to do things on, and you go and you take their hard drive out of their laptop, 
But before you take it, you come in and say, I'm working for the help desk and I'm here to fix your machine. I hear you've had problems. And everyone always has problems with their laptops. So they're always happy to see someone come fix them. <clears throat> so they say, go ahead. You're on their system, their network. You take their hard drive, you leave with it, you put another hard drive in, you have the original now in your possession. That seems authorized. Does it? Authorization. <laughs> Is that in scope with your pen test or not? I think pen, pen I think I think we're getting into CFAA and and out of uh, hagback. <laughs> well, not necessarily because this. Well, I don't know how much I can say, but it's basically <laughs> that damage is more of what I was getting at. You know, you're authorized in the sense that they thought you're going to do something that you were authorized by someone else to do. They're okay with it themselves. You're in an environment that, in theory, you have some access to, but not full authorization. When you leave, what is damage defined by? Um, in modern context, cloud is even easier. Like, is there any damage? Or in the case of the botnet, the Mirai, did you really damage the camera, or does it need a firmware update? Uh, and it starts so working again. A lot of the cameras are bricked. That it, either because it's not possible to repair them, or it's not just within the realm of the owner just doesn't know how to repair them. I'm just curious. I, with that example, how many people think that that's OK? <laughs> Yeah. But you brick someone's camera who's attacking you. The camera thing, I'm sorry. The camera thing. Brick the camera. Okay. I, I, I'm just curious because it's, it, it's, so it's most interesting. Most of you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting to figure out what the, the norms are around, around this sort of thing. I think that most people are very wary to let someone else figure out how to remedy a problem using their own property. That is, the way in which, I mean, letting, the, letting someone else take control of your property and figure out what is the just disposition of that without any consultation or, you know, to you. You know what's really interesting here is the intersection between that statement and the debate we're having and the debate over automa automatic patching. Mm -hmm. Right, because automatic patching is exactly that. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole discourse, obviously, right in the context of security that you can't trust users to make all the right decisions. Not because they're bad or stupid, but just because there are so many and the systems are so complex that we should be taking a decent amount of the choices away from the users and having it happen automatically. So the question here isn't so much about that as how do you vet who gets to decide what does happen, right? Who's choosing what the patch is in this sense, right? This is, it's, it's like a side-loaded patch, is sort of what we're talking mm -hmm. about, right? Well, that's where we really suck in inf information security is really bad at integrity. I mean, we're good at confidentiality and availability, but when you're pushing patches out, there's a lot of question about, are you putting in a better patch that's not going to brick the device? Have you really tested it properly? So that's a real weak area. Just to go back to Levin's question, though, if, if you know for a fact that the device that you're going to brick is not the property of your attacker, would that change your willingness to brick it? Would, so show of hands, who would still brick it in that situation? So if it's attacking Can you... Can I get your names? Lennon needs them for later. <laughs> so if it's attacking you, you've got this camera out in Vietnam, and it's flooding you with traffic, and there's nothing you can do about it. Your ISP is calling you up and saying, hey, we're charging you for this constant traffic that's coming toward, towards you. So you have to pay for that, that traffic. How do you stop it? It's an issue of self-defense, that um, I want to stop it. My only option is to brick it. So uh, what, they're, what you're saying, what Leonard would say, I shouldn't be doing that, is um, this learned helplessness <laughs> that only the government is there to make these ethical questions, to answer these ethical questions, and that you can't do it for yourself. And um, that's a bad situation to be in because they're not going to help you. You call up Leonard and say, hey, or call up the FBI and say, hey, there's this machine attacking me, and the FBI will say, well, we don't know who you are. If you're a, a, a rock star or a, corp a corporation, they'll come help you. But if it's you or me, they won't. So the, the self-defense argument, the, the, particularly the analog to the fact that you know, there, is, there is the uh, permission to defend yourself in the physical world is one that we hear pretty often. Um, what, is the, what is the argument around that when it relates to hackback? Like, you want to respond to it? Oh, me. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, we're doing a thing right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, <laughs> I was busy trying to fix Rao's problem. He, uh... <laughs> well, I like to Is think it about it. Yet? I like yeah. to think about it in terms of again. I said the mob, the mules. But if someone convinces someone else to harm you, let's say they pay the money, bodyguard or someone else to punch you, and you take defensive action and protect yourself against the person that was hired, 
Why isn't that self-defense? Why isn't that ethical? Even though you're not getting at the source, the person who really started the whole thing, you're going after the person who's an immediate threat to you. Aren't you just defending yourself from the threat? So I, I think there are a couple answers to that. I guess from a policy level, pulling the aperture back and saying, okay, so everyone now asserts this right to damage a third party, an innocent, unwitting third party's... Not innocent, so they're attacking me. But, but, they're, but their system isn't compromised. They're right? unaware. We're not they're attacking just... them, we're attacking their system. Okay, fine, you're, you're destroying their property. So can we agree on that? Okay. So let me put it like this. But, 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 they, throw, but they didn't have a role in that, right? If someone's trying to throw a punch at you, unaware or not, maybe they've been taken over, they're a zombie, and they're trying to get at your brain. But <laughs> if they're coming at you and you disable them, <laughs> if you disable them, and you don't necessarily have to damage them, but you maybe break their legs, but maybe you don't. Maybe you just <laughs> put so, them in a so this, this is the question. This is the issue that I think we're skirting. We are actually skirting, which is, which is attribution, right? The, the, the one thing that I think makes this conversation very different than many others, and this comes up with letters of Mark and militias and things like that, is... Wait, are, are, people, are people familiar with letters of Mark? Show of hands, people who are familiar with it? Can you give a one sentence explanation for people who didn't raise their hands? Only one sentence. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you have a character count of 140. Just say and a lot. Yeah. It can be really long. Okay, yeah. it, it essentially it's constitutional authority, with, actually found in the Constitution, to allow private parties to act essentially as agents of the government um, to, in most senses that we know, and which has been used, um, seize the property of pirates is how it's come up. Um, there are questions about whether let the, this sort of theory applies to cyber that um, touches on a, a variety of questions, including under our Constitution. It seems to have been used in connection with war and not outside that, that context. Also, um, to the extent that authority was actually used, um, people tend to cherry pick the facts. Uh, it seems that, for example, people who were authorized uh, under Legends of Mark as private actors um, were not allowed to board a, a, another ship. They weren't allowed to enter the um, the, prop, uh, the, uh, the waters of other countries to do this, which makes it not a great, arguably, analog to what happens um, in this space, unless you're going to argue that cyberspace is, you know, the open digital seas. ocean. Yes, it's a digital <laughs> ocean, which some people have argued. I think that's incorrect because actually everything that happens in cyberspace is actually happening on someone's computer hardware located someplace, um, and we fix the way we apply the law. This is definitely more that. than one sentence. Um, no, I just use a lot of commas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that, that, so like, oh, that's what I was. But, but I do think that if, if you have this level of confidence that yes, the guy who threw a punch at you is the guy that you are punching, just on the level of equity, it feels different, right? No, you can go ahead. So two things I was just going to say. The first is, if we're talking about self-defense, it's also important to note that there's an escalation element to self-defense, right? If someone punches me, I can't shoot them in the head. There, that's not acceptable self-defense. Proportionality. Right. Yes. Proportionality is a key component to self-defense in the physical context, and so it would need to be here as well. The other things that I was going to say is, the first is note that we've shifted from the question of how do we address community-wide problems to the question yeah, of now like, I'm yeah. being attacked and I'm responding. So there's a different set of trade-offs here, yep. right? Um, and then I wanted to suggest that the attribution debate is a really hard debate, right? And there's a lot of reasons why it's good and it's bad, right? Even if, let, even if you were to posit that you knew that the person you were going after is the guy who did it, if attribution was 100% perfect, I would argue that there is still an interesting question as to whether it's a good idea. And it gets back to this idea of investing your $100, right? If you're a company or an individual and trying to protect yourself and you have $100 to invest, how do you distribute that? And if we look at the history of security strategy and defense, one of the things that's very clear is defenders are more effective in situations where they have control of the environment and understanding of the environment. And in fact, that's generally the only situation in which they're effective. Disagree. Okay. <laughs> um, but what I would say is the farther away you are from an environment you control, and I'd be interested to hear your take on this, the less effective you tend to be. And if you look at security strategy, you can see this, everything from Clausewitz up to Boyd in the, in the last century. And so what we are doing is we're taking dollars that we would be investing in a situation we, where we are, in theory, in control on our network. And we're moving them to a place where we are not in control, off our network. So it's somewhere where the odds are actually much worse for us. That's not saying we're great at defense today. There are a lot of things that show that we're not. 
but it is suggesting as you're investing, there's a lot more marginal return on the network where you have control. There's a lot of unexplored potential to be better there than going off of it and farther away from and, it. And let me add a, a, a less smart sounding way of, of, of saying that. We, <laughs> so we, we actually had a round table with a variety of companies because we were interested in finding out what's actually happening out there in this space. We, we've read, read the articles. Um, a lot of them we think may be academic and not really about the practices that companies are using. Um, and so we had a Chatham House Rules discussion with companies who we believe were pretty candid because they admitted to some conduct that might have gotten them in, in an odd place. But what they, what they tended to say was things like, you know, if I have a client who's telling me that, you know, can you develop perhaps a, a tool that will allow my files to auto-encrypt once they're outside my network um, and, you know, build that infrastructure, our answer is, yeah, you should invest in data loss prevention in lieu of us trying to develop something as complicated as that. Um, I mean, the figures on patching and things of that sort. And by the way, this is said as, in my cybersecurity capacity as a prosecutor. If you're a victim of a crime, we, we view as a victim and we will prosecute that. And it's not your fault because someone has broken the law and broken into your network. On the cybersecurity policy end, though, there are questions about what is the way of tuning practices so that we have less insecurity um, and greater reliability. Yeah, we built that in 2012. We built systems that when they wake up, they figure out where they are, and if they're not where they're supposed to be, they're encrypted, and they don't decrypt. They don't get a key. Hmm. So. so I want to address this argument of um, trade-offs, which is a very good argument. If you do one thing, it means you can't do another one. And it's why arguments like defense and death are kind of weak, because they don't ever mean trade-offs. I'm going to remove uh, security from my, from my inside to put it on the outside. So that's a good argument, except he gets it wrong. And that is, is that there's also decreasing marginal returns. There's only so much you can invest in your firewall before additional investment is meaningless. There's only so much you can invest in an antivirus before antivirus becomes meaningless, before the additional investment is meaningless. So just because you're, you're trading off from one to another doesn't mean they're the same value of dollars. I can take one dollar from my firewall that's really not providing much value and put it into just the start of a hack back program that has a lot of value. And they're a different dollar. They got a lot of value over here, and I'm taking away very little value over here because the additional dollars of that more expensive firewall doesn't matter. Secondly, there's the issue of uh, a general hackback program, of which is probably a bad idea because it's, it's, it, yeah, it is costly, versus a specific problem. Like I, if you know Russian hackers go in and get the Coke formula, the secret Coke formula. Yeah, they didn't care about a lot of documents, but they care a lot about that document and finding it and erasing it from the internet. It's like ra ransomware, is that most ransomware is not paid to pay. They just wipe the, the system, reinstall Windows, and go on with life, and they don't ever care about decrypting the, the documents, except for that one system that had that critical database encrypted, in which case they'll do anything they can in order to decrypt that, that one ransomware device, pay whatever it takes, because that data is critical for them. So we're not talking about necessarily a whole program but specific instances where a company might need to hack back. I hate to say it, but I agree. And the, which happens uh. which happens sometimes <laughs> with the raw. But I'd give you a different spin that you can spend an inordinate amount of money and not understand your own environment and not know what to do. And I've seen that. And then we propose, or we could take away the threat, and it'll cost you a little bit of money, and it'll not be a problem anymore. And so that's been a decision. And that's also true, again, with these boundaries that don't exist. You may not understand your own environment, but you can understand a cloud environment extremely well because it has a sort of uh, predictability to it. And if the attacker is in a cloud environment, not only is it easier to understand, but it's also easier to collaborate and eliminate the threat by going after them in that environment. So I'd just say Very quickly. Two, two things. Uh, I'm always quick. Um, two things. I think the Coke formula example is a really great one because if you can't stop the one instance of the Coke formula from leaving your network, once the Russian intruders have taken it and mirrored it in a bunch of places and probably pulled the data out and converted it in a lot of ways, you're going to be in a much worse place to try to stop it once it's out there in a bunch of replications across the network, right? So that's actually an interesting example of where I think it is actually much harder to do this when it's outside your control. The other point, I totally agree with you on the marginal return point, but here's what I would say. So there's the saying, you know, a, a, a good offense is the best kind of defense. And if you're sort of building a sports team, you invest in your defense till they're very, very good, but you also need offense. You need both. But I would argue, Leonard was talking about dwell time earlier, 60 days to 200 days. I've seen 45 days. Whatever the number is, it's weeks or months. And if we stop and think about that for a minute, it's weeks or months, and we completely accept that, right? We sort of say that's the bottom line, and let's look at where we could go elsewhere to get better marginal return. We don't say... 
how good is the standard of our defense right now? And why is it that dwell time is still so incredibly high? There's absolutely a point where you reach diminishing returns. I would just argue that on the defensive side, we are nowhere near that. And there's a lot that we could do, not by just buying more firewalls, but by investing in new technologies and by changing the way we run security inside our networks to do the understanding and control better. The choice is do we accept that we can't do that or do we think we could make it better? And that's the fundamental question. All right, I, I would like to have a little time for audience questions, so I'm gonna cut you off there. There is there's one question that I wanna ask first uh, before we get to the audience. Sorry, guys. Um, but the one question I wanna know is what role can uh, internet infrastructure providers play in this whole thing? Do they have a role to play? Many roles. <laughs> Next question. Pithy. <laughs> okay, yes. then we'll go to the questions, shall I? <laughs> but I mean, they can be one of your best allies in providing, I mean, I talk to them all the time, but they can try to provide a clean network, which effectively means finding the threats and blocking them for you. So creating that predictability, like I said, a cloud provider essentially becomes the clean environment that blocks, investigates, deters threats better than you could internal to your own environment. Thanks. Um, all right, so the gentleman at the back has had his hand up forever. So let's start there. The green shirt. Thank you. Yeah. Do you still? Oh. So re regarding uh, what you stated earlier about uh, legislation, you know, people not the, the, the government. First of all, you said you can't investigate every cyber crime because there are so many. I'm a small company. I got hit. I'm going to go out of business. Now. I don't have a legal recourse because I'm too small for you guys to investigate. What kind of legislation are, are you guys even thinking of to help me? Somebody who isn't going to be investigated, somebody who can't do anything because I don't have any recourse to fight back with. Wait, so I, I'm, not, I'm pretty confident you're not going to love this question, uh, this answer. But um, <laughs> So one of the reasons why, I mean, I've seen a development in the way the government is approaching this problem. Um, and that is, I think, uh, even the last decade, the government has come to the realization of exactly how complicated it is. Um, I don't think there's any agency right now that would say, we are the answer and we will solve this. Certainly law enforcement wouldn't say that. Um, so if the question is like, how are you going to better secure your network, then you start looking to things like, well, that's why we are investing in information sharing authorities. That's why you have FBI Secret Service and DHS attempting to push more information out. That if we can't get to the threat actors on a you know, per actor basis, we have to be better at hardening the targets on the front end and encouraging both practices and standards that will result in that hardening of systems. So uh, I know that on an individual basis that's not a great answer, this does go back to the other question that I have, which is, as an individual, you know, business, small business owner, I do wonder what it is that you would do, though, that would be hacked back, that would help with that incident. But it's it's not necessarily that I want to hack back. What recourse do I have? Period. If you are telling me I am one of the people that you are not going to be able to investigate and do something. I mean, the only thing I, just to quickly add on to that, I mean, the reason why we have something like the Internet Complaint Center um, is they serve the purpose of bundling complaints to, so we can figure out where to put our resources against what are higher value threats. And that's how we get to some of the actors, even internationally, that we've gotten to in the last several years. We are prosecuting international actors at a pace that we hadn't before that. Um, and that that is because individual businesses are getting hit, but it's not just because one business is getting hit, it's because you know, most actors work at scale. Um, and so there may be recourse for you. Unfortunately, it may not be as responsive as, I know they went after the one guy who did this to me. So your answer is, is you have a complaint center that when he complains, it may bundle up to, to going after one actor, because they're hitting a lot of businesses. So you may get help, you may not, you don't know. From the, uh, and, that's, and, that's, and that's what you have. That's three. in the law enforcement. That's what you have today, that's yes. all you have. For the law enforcement way. Okay, we're gonna, yep. So this may be echoing on the internet infrastructure side, cloud providers. So can we elaborate a little bit more about maybe what responsibilities we want to lobby for them to have? And 
you know, if my defense in depth when I'm trying to scan my own workloads there in the cloud, and they tell me that I'm hacking back myself, is there some problem here? Anyway. I mean, yeah, a great analogy for that is the mall. Like, when you go inside the mall, they're the provider of basically all the services, and you're just a shop front sitting in the mall. So can you have your own bodyguards and, you know, militia inside your shop, or do you have to rely on the mall to provide those for you? Typically, it's the mall has security and you don't, and that's a service they provide. So there's a lot of responsibility they have. But at the same time, we have a lot of cases where random armed people in a mall shoot someone who's robbing a store, and that person is hailed as a hero for stopping a worse crime. Yeah. So actually, one answer to that question is, is Microsoft, is that they have a whole division that basically do hack back. It's not you know illegal hack back. They go to the to the government and get authority to do so. Like um, with that no IP thing, where they took control over a dynamic DNS provider in, in order to then um, uh, stop all the, the command and control systems for all these different worms and viruses. Which wouldn't have been an issue if they had done it. But they, they well. screwed up and then screwed the whole company, so they did a really bad job. But if they'd done that well, it would have been a good, shining success. Right. So, okay. <laughs> so anyway, that's an example to your question. So before we take the next question, I'm just going to, we are just before 12.25, which is when we were scheduled to finish, but there is nothing in this room till 1, so we can stay on a little bit for those who would like to continue asking questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, well, we don't have that on our time. So, thanks, Joel. Love you. Um, but yeah, uh, anyone who, who wants to keep going for a little bit, we can probably keep going for another 15 minutes or so, if that's okay with you four. Yeah? Okay. All right. Um, I think that the next question, yeah. Um, I'd like to hear your opinions on where the line for authorization falls with something like JavaScript running in a web browser. Like you say, it's not okay to send an attacker a piece of information that will like try to find their IP address. But if it's a web browser accessing your site, you can send them JavaScript to do that. It'll just run it and send you back results. You don't really have to hack anything. Um, and if that's not okay, why is this okay for advertising companies to do this? And um, this is going, and for another example, companies that detect you're running ad blocker software, they know that you don't want to run an ad in your browser, but they circumvent your ad blocker. That's an excellent question. I think it's, it, we, we should have addressed it before you asked it. That there is this issue of at what point Am I crossing a line with the JavaScript I send you? If I do a buffer overflow in the JavaScript, I've clearly crossed, crossed the line, but in terms of we all know. But what would a reasonable person, not a, te a techie, understand as where that line is? And I don't think anyone knows. I think it's up to, you know, talk to your lawyer, and your lawyer, lawyer will say they don't know, and talk to, 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 to uh, Leonard. Leonard, sorry. I was thinking Bailey, but I know you're That's fine. So, um, but even, uh, even the buffer is you you would have to know that you are going to exceed the buffer for it to be wrong. There's a lot of tricky stuff that advertisers do, all, everyone does all the time, to try to get all your personal information using cookies and stuff to track you. And uh, at what point is this crossing the line of unauthorized access? So, so, yeah, so in Hackback, you, you definitely use beaconing. You definitely leave docs, and people pick them up, and they take them, and it tells you their location. And it does not seem to me that different from advertising or common commerce methods of figuring out who's accessing your site. I, I, so I guess, I mean, a, a couple of things. One, this question, and I think a number of the other ones that came up, I think reflect one of the challenges in doing things in legislation. So. Uh, you can either draft a statute that tries to be very detailed and tells you exactly what you can do, and in this technical environment where you know a pivot of the facts changes the analysis entirely, that's pretty impractical. On the other end, you could draft a statute that is fairly vague, that talks about you know, reasonable measures or things of that sort, um, and the concern is that's that's simply not enough guidance for you to know what's what's right. And this is, this is the tension and push and pull specific, I think, to this area of, of law, where you know, you're trying to say, exactly what am I allowed to do? That's a fair question. You know, it does depend on you know, a variety of, of things. What is the interaction between client and server? And what, you know, what is happening there? How do we define and think about that, that exchange of information? By and large, um, I think we are driven by, or in Kerr, by norms, right? So, um, you know, I think um, the cases in which 
we have, as a department, I think, gotten sideways with folks as in cases where people would assert that we are not applying the law consistent with what are norms of technology. And I think that's where trying to be smarter or having folks who are tech savvy who are applying the laws and understand how these sorts of technical issues work is, 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 is fairly important for what is a reasonable, consistent application of the law. Um, so, it, 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 and unfortunately though, that does some kind of come down to the kind of a fact based analysis. This always reminds me of people smoke pot, that's kind of the norm, but people try to criminalize it even though it is the norm. Now, also, I wanted to point out that the, the norm for web browsers is you have a URL on the top that we all edit, but that the rest of the world doesn't. So what's the norm? If I edit the URL to access something, and for us, the norm is yes, that is the norm. You, you edit URLs. But 90% of the population, the norm is they never edit the URL. They never actually ever reach something that doesn't involve clicking on something or typing in something into a web form. So this norms-based argument, I would say, is, is, is crap, because it, it divides the world between two sets of norms. Those of us who created the inter internet have one set of norms, and the visitors, the outsiders to the internet, have a different set of norms, and they come after us and arrest us. But Rob, the law is for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Norms to evolve. The smoking pot thing, that was not normal like 20 years ago. Now it is. Yeah, look at Prohibition. The norm was everyone was drinking, and they outlawed it. And it was used for selecting the forces. And the law got repealed in part because of the normative and legal conflict. This is your point about how they, but one thing that I would just say that I think is interesting here, so you're using the beaconing example, and it's important, we're having a, talk, a discussion about hackback, but I think, again, it's important to say it's hard to have that discussion because actually hackback is a whole bunch of different things. Yep. And the trade-off and consequences here are really different. I don't think someone would analogize the um, advertiser's activity to targeted destruction of a computer. Right. But we would analogize it to a beacon. Why and not? What? Why not? <laughs> because I don't want my personal information out there, and they are purposely coming in and stealing it. So why not? Well, but they're not destroying it. I'm just saying that within so the... I have to destroy something? I can't just steal it? No, but within the umbrella... Of the law? Under the umbrella of hackback, as we're discussing it, as you move up this ratchet, the trade-offs change a lot, is my only point. And so having a debate about beaconing and targeted destruction in the same conversation is hard, because they're different issues. Yeah, confidentiality, availability, different topics. Right. There's someone with a microphone back there. So... Um, I, I appreciate the, the uh, focus on norms here because this is the, the issue that I wanted to bring up. Um, in the sort of municipal law of any individual state, uh, we can deal with that sort of on a criminal law basis. But globally, we don't have uh, a, a set of norms that has developed through the sort of customary international law process. At some point, we start to either have to think about this from a conventional law standpoint or we have to go, uh, you know, like the legality of use case, we've got to go ask the court for an advisory opinion, I, which I don't think anybody wants to do. It's never been done since. So uh, what are the activities that are going on, if any, at this point to start to develop some conventional notion of what is and is not allowed, since clearly the process of developing customary international norms is not going to happen fast enough Actually, to be of any use. You say advisory opinions. There's this guy at the DOJ named Leonard Bailey who's been writing some document about. So now he can remember your name. <laughs> about. <laughs> it was, it was done, like, the document he just did with the um, um, vulnerability disclosure. It, it sets a norm now from the DOJ's point of view of what is normal for vulnerability disclosure. So that if you go in and uh, now. Uh, advise a medical company that there's a flaw in their medical equipment, and they come after and, and try to get the DOJ to prosecute you for hacking their medical equipment, they've got documents now that says, well, you know, it's kind of following this norm of vulnerability disclosure, doing nothing abnormal. And as well as other documents up there that says that's things like about like scanning the internet. Is that in the norms or not? Well, he says it is in the norms. We can scan the internet. So, so that's fine within the sort of municipal law of the United States. I, my question was really about the, the broader uh, right. international law regime. So I can actually say that there's a risk right now. I mean, I, I'm from an academic background, and I'm still an academic, academic technically because I teach in an international university. I teach ethics of cyber in a foreign country. And 
there is a danger that the norms are being defined by academics. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of work being pushed out right now by people in the last six months about what the norms are. And they say, for example, blows my mind, that there is no deterrence. Hackback has no deterrent effect, cyber has no deterrent effect, and they're trying to create this sort of definition or a sense of norm around things which to me are flat false. Like not only have we used it as a deterrent, but it still works as a deterrent. We're trying to talk about it as a way to deter people from doing things. Uh, so it's a great question. There are people talking at the United Nations level. There are people talking at an EU level. So there's a lot of it going on, um, and it works both ways. We're trying to define the norms, and I hope from a practical, hands-on experience level, not just from an ivory tower level of what we'd like them to be. But it also works the other way that we're able to start a company that does hack back and things because there's difference and there's gray area between people's definitions. In some place it might be still authorized so we can fight for that. Just the way the states in the US work as well. Some states have different ideas. And one point that will also not make you happy is that I think people forget how new all of this is. So if, if you pin, I mean, I personally think about the internet as, for our purposes, the purpose of we care about, you know, somewhere around 1995, 96, where you had SSL and, you know, in browsers and people start using it for e-commerce, which changed the face of the internet, in my opinion. But if you, if you pin it from then, you look at other types of activities that we have global norms about, law of armed conflict. We've been at war for many, many, many years uh, as a society, and we've developed norms around that. We're working on, you know, a, a, the third decade of, of this. Um, as a scale, as a, a measure of this, we've got the Cybercrime Convention, which is the only international instrument that deals with, with cyber. Um, and we have more than 50 countries that have signed on to that. Uh, you know, 180 some countries on, on the planet. Um, now, not all of them have to join in order for that to work. But we are we are still moving towards you know getting us recognized on a on a global level. Doesn't the the Tallinn Manual have some stuff on this? I think I'm using the wrong yeah. word. The Tallinn Manual some. from NATO has a great description of what they would consider norms of like when someone attacks you in cyberspace, what is proportionate for you to attack back? And so that's that kind of falls in, into this as well. It's actually the, the first version was was written quite well. The second version is kind of like meandered. <laughs> Um, but I, th I mean, I think that the point with this is that the question you asked is absolutely the question to ask and is being asked on an international level at the moment and people are spending a lot of time on it. And two things I would say. One thing that's important here is when we say the you, the you in this case is really important because a lot of the international discussions, the you is a country. And that's very different from the discussion here yeah. about individuals. And so that's right. A lot of the international law is concerned with what countries can do. And with the, a lot of the discussion is concerned with that. But the other thing that I would say is you, it, I would argue that you might not want norm creation and law creation, international law creation, to go a lot faster than this. Only because, and the reason I say that is, everyone knows the slippery slope argument, right? There's also a wacky wall argument, which is if you create a wall, no matter where you put it, something's going to be arbitrarily on one side or the other, and it's going to have a bad effect. And right now, we're still trying to understand the scope of what one can do or should do. And so if there was a drive to create something and it happened tomorrow, I guarantee you everyone in this room would be unhappy about it for very different reasons. And so it might be that we're just not at that place yet. This is sort of teeing in with what Leonard was saying. Yeah, a good example of that is the authors of Tellen, if I understand correctly, are starting to argue that the ransomware was a crime against humanity, which I disagree with vehemently. And my research is in this area, and my experience is in this area, and I cannot believe they're making this argument, but that's an example to me of where they would say that the spread of ransomware, because of its impact, and we haven't really discussed damage thoroughly, uh, is not only a crime, but a crime against humanity of massive scale that requires international cooperation to resist. I. We're hey. definitely having this conversation later. <laughs> definitely. Cool. Hey, um, do you eventually see this heading down a path of if you hire a lawyer to defend yourself legally, you could hire the equivalent of a penetration team to actually hack back on your behalf, kind of like you on a retainer? So it's the idea if you have an insurance co contract for a million dollars worth of you know, um, damages, if you get hacked into, you can pay your, your average retainer to a hack back company that would basically defend on your behalf, kind of like a mutually assured destruction thing. Like a bodyguard. Yeah, you fuck me, I fuck you. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not really like a bodyguard, is it? Yes. Not really. <laughs> it's much more, more like, like a private guard. security service right. that has black helicopters that you <laughs> right. It's more like having your own tiny militia. <laughs> yes. But it's like a bodyguard militia. Mercenaries. <laughs> We're talking about mercenaries, yeah. So 
th this is a great area of research. I, uh, and this, again, goes back to where I started before I got into computers. But you see that there are, oh, it's so complicated and such a big, in fact, my talk yesterday touched on this. Militias tend to be out of control, amoral, linked to something which isn't a norm, and therefore do huge atrocities. And so they're very frowned upon. In fact, the formation of police, back to your social comment, was to reduce the number of militias, not only because of cost, economic considerations. People didn't want to be spending money on hiring militias all the time. There was a social good to creating a, a police that everybody would rely on. But, but also just because they're out of control and the politics of it. So that being said, if the norm is so bad that you can't get representation, sometimes militias are the only way for you to get justice. So there's no straight answer, but as someone who has been hired to do things that will make things better as a private person for companies, not only does it happen and exist, but it's a good thing. You're, in a sense, you're solving a crime or solving a, a problem. PIs do this, mercenaries do this, bodyguards do this. They exist in physical and logical except that they usually do so under some regulatory framework that imposes some standards on the manner in which they act. And if you did that here, I, I'm not sure that people have teased out what the consequences are fully in that um, you know, under a regulatory framework, if that looks a certain way, you actually become a state actor, which means the Fourth Amendment applies to you, which means that you have a variety of different obligations that now attach to you as you would. As a, so I mean, there are things like that that kind of have to still be teased out if you're saying these are bodies that should be recognized or individuals should be recognized to be able to wield certain authority that might otherwise break the law. Yeah, in the old days, great examples, digital forensics, we used to just do it and it was just the thing private citizens did a lot to each other. A lot of companies were investigating each other, uh, competitive intelligence and all kinds of crazy stuff. And then the private investigators got wind of this and said, whoa, 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 you got to be certified PIs and you got to pass. And a lot of states started to enforce this. Not all of them, but in a lot of states, you have to sort of go through some standard. But in the old Wild West days, we were just deferring it up everywhere. Yep. So good or bad, it's hard to say. Does explain your facial hair. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that the ACDC is very vague, it's three pages. What does a more ideal piece of legislation that would legalize hackback actually look like? And kind of related to the previous question, if this does get legalized, how does it change the industry? We already have a company in the UK that offers DDoS for hire, uh, SQL injection for hire to private companies uh, in a legitimate space. How would it change? And that's industry? legal under the CMA? Well, when we covered it, they kind of quietly got rid of the service. But they were advertising it, and people were buying. <laughs> Bravo! <laughs> well, my ideal legislation would just be repeal the CFAA. There's there, there few crimes that, that they prosecute under the CFAA that can also that can't also be prosecuted under all the other laws. You look at all the hackers that are uh, being caught. It's yeah, they're being uh, prosecuted under the CFAA, but also all the other laws because you know, they seal stuff and they wiretap and blah blah blah. So I don't think we need the CFAA. In that, weird, that's just me. In a weird way, it's like asking, you know, should we define authorization for physical spaces? You know, it's like if you get rid of the CFAA because it talks so much about authorization, are you really doing any harm to prosecution of people for entering? One thing I would just note is we do define authorization for physical spaces in extensive detail, right? I mean, there's a, there's a huge ream of legal history and legal statute about how to define whether you're authorized inside a physical space. Right. The difference is it's been around for so long, it's spread through the law in all these different ways, and we've tested out a lot of kinks. There are still problems with it, but we've tested out a lot of kinks. Comparatively, trying to figure out in this context is still really new, to Leonard's point. Yeah. And the analogs break down at some point. You know, Obviously, the issue is having sufficient notice that something, for example, is not authorized. Um, in the physical world, the notion of trespass, you, know, you, you want people to post signs or to put up a fence and make sure people understand what that means. Um, you know, the debate is you know, whether you need a technological measure that is essentially your, your gate or fence, or can your policies be your fence, or so. You know. Yeah, I feel like the internet moves at such fast pace. I feel like it's been around forever. I mean, I feel like these issues, I, I remember banner pages. It used to be so required to put up a banner because if you don't say you're not authorized here, then you're giving them authorization, like a welcome mat. And I've heard even recently from Harvard, there's an analogy where they said, if you're not protecting your systems, in a way that people know they're not supposed to get in, you're leaving cash on your lawn. And it's just sitting there for anyone to take. This is the world of analogies that is... Right. Yes. But to Rob's point, 
could we tease it out by just extending the physical language and build on that rather than trying to build, well, with CFAA, we just say authorized and it doesn't even really get defined and it's super gray. But, you know, stealing money is illegal. It doesn't matter whether you access the computer or not. So if you steal credit card numbers and, tra and traffic in them, it's not a CFAA thing. You can prosecute them on that. Right. Well, I guess this is as a prosecutor where I, I guess I'd argue people can be kind of hand waving and glib about what is and isn't criminalized. For example, uh, you know, we're dealing with theft of, of data. Um, people have said, well, why not the trade secrets that you can get them under that? Well, actually, no, because not all information, for example, is a trade secret. In fact, there's a, a specific definition of that, that class of information that, that's provided under the law. Uh, there are people who are, pro who are prosecuted for only a 1030 violation, and that's because we don't have another offense um, under the federal law that we think reaches them. So, um, I would... so I, I'm, I'm just going to jump in here quickly because we, we need to wrap up, but also, um, I, I think I probably am the person who, other than you, has had an actual conversation with the government about doing this, and it wasn't this government. Um, so Harvard recently ran a uh, workshop, I think, I think that this is okay to say, I think I was told by them that I could say this, um, they recently ran a workshop with the Israeli government who are looking at potentially authorizing hackback, and the question on the table was how do we come up with a legal framework that will make this viable and pragmatic, and every... Uh, expert, and I sort of say expert because I was there, um, that they had in the room sort of very strongly, strongly urged them not to do it. Nobody felt that there was a really good way to yeah, do it. Um, and yeah, we should have invited you, Rob. Next time I'll make sure you're on the list. Um, and, and I think if you were going to look at doing it, then, you know, to Nathaniel's point, you need to have a very, very, very specific definition of exactly what it is you're authorizing. And the reality is most experts that I've spoken to, and I'm not including you in that, um, uh, uh, have a point of view that um, hackback, when you're talking about an individual entity launching counter-strike against another entity that has attacked them, um, and you know, actually trying to do something that will stop them in some way or take revenge or anything like that, that that is just not something that is a, a sort of genie that can be kept in the bottle effectively. So something like beaconing, I think people do see a way of coming up with a framework and coming up with oversight and making that viable. But something like, um, you know, actually sort of launching a, a counter-strike in some way designed to disable your adversary, I think people who have spent a lot of time looking at this uh, in the circles that I've spoken to, which is not you, um, tend to have a pretty strong view that um, the public examples we have where somebody has tried to take an action designed to have like a specific effect of this, it's, I mean, you know, when we were at the round table at the workshop, it was palpable how many people were trying to avoid saying the word Stuxnet in the room. And um, and somebody then did say it, and there was like this momentary silence, and I was just sat there giggling. Um, and and so like you know every time we've seen an attempt at doing something like that, and that like stuck that was obviously not act back, but it was an attempt at taking a very targeted action, and it got way out of scope. And that's the problem is like how do we keep that in the bottle? Stop at you. Um, so I have not I've not heard of anybody coming up with a legal framework that would address that point. Certainly, beaconing is something that people are looking at much more. So we have one last question here. Yeah. yeah. Um, th thank you to Jen and Leonard for the talk, and thank you for the panel for all this like good food for thought. Um, I'd like to get your opinion. I probably know your opinions, but maybe Leonard's opinion in particular about if if there was a repeal of the CFAA, and <laughs> it wasn't just about hack back, but like hack forward, just pure hack hacking, like lots of vigilante hacking. Could it not be argued that? You know, it might be a turbulent 18 months or a couple of years where all this stuff is just going on on the internet. Machines are getting bricked and taken down, but wouldn't that encourage people, to your point, to just be more um, uh, more thoughtful towards securing themselves, not buying you know junk IoT devices that are vulnerable all the time, stuff that gets auto-updated, auto um, people practicing good security hygiene. Um, wouldn't that just, wouldn't this all kind of work itself out in a couple of years? So, I mean, this is just a thought experience, right. I don't know. I, I think that sort of dystopian plan actually may have, oh my god, are you <laughs> serious? <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel pretty safe, but if you stop using Windows. I, so one of the things that I find difficult about this area, and one of the things I enjoy about it because it's so complex, 
is this disparity in, in knowledge, right? So both in policymakers, but definitely in consumers, people believe everything beyond their keyboard is magic, <laughs> right? That, that's how all that happens. It, it, it is magic. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is, Jen. Magic. Very nice magic. Yeah, there are um, tiny fairies in my life. <laughs> but that makes it really difficult to, to like, calibrate what should be behavior and what will drive rational behavior, right? Because people are, are not similarly situated in terms of, of their understanding of what must be done in order to prevent you know, this bad consequence. You would think, I mean, I've heard people argue that allowing, um, that lifting protections for consumers from credit card theft would create an immediate consequence. And that's probably right. Um, you would have a lot of angry people who would then exert pressure down the line on companies that would result in, um, at the same time, I think we, we don't think that that is a, a sort of either a fair way or just way of proceeding and getting us to a place of, of stability. Um, I mean, it's an interesting thought experiment. I mean, you're right. Maybe at some point things would settle. There would be you know, companies that people would sign up for, for their security, that would you know, uh, deal with the people who have less knowledge, uh, and you know, thereby you would lift all boats to at least that level. Um, I, I could see a whole lot of wreckage before getting there, though. Oh, yeah, no doubt yeah. about the wreckage, I yeah. just think. Yeah. You know, like, if, like if people were hacking uh, uh, bad networks that let spoofed packets out of their networks, I mean, then we could put an end to all this, uh, the reflective DDoSs that we experience, right? I mean, so history shows this doesn't work. And in particular, I do a lot of research on learning systems now, machine learning systems, for example. And this is like children as well. If you remove all guards and all lessons and you say, just figure it out, you get the Lord of the Flies effect, which is they start killing each other and really bad things happen. And you lead towards anarchy and chaos as opposed to they naturally form better hardening guidelines and they create a better law. It just hasn't been the case. People need to learn from example. And so if you have a CFFA, CFAA, which is bad, it's a good thing to improve. It's an example of how you can make it better. So I would say, back to the earlier question, I would try to get cases on the books, precedent, things that people could learn from and work from, as opposed to remove everything and start over, because that tends to lead, at least from studying history, much worse scenarios, and you extend the time it takes for people to learn how to get better. All right, um, so we're gonna wrap up. Thank you so much, particularly for staying so long. We really appreciate it. Um, I would like to thank my panelists, all of them, shockingly. Um, you guys are awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you guys so much for joining us.